Welcome to episode five of Refactoring with Bob. I am Bob, and I'm going to start this video the way I arguably should start all of my videos, with an apology. And the apology is because I have a cold, and so my voice is a little rough, a little nasally. You may hear me sniffling. Uh, unfortunately, these videos are sort of a crime of opportunity, and I just make them whenever I have a chance, so I can't wait until I don't have a cold to record these. And so that's just, I guess, a long-winded way of saying deal with it, which in retrospect is not much of an apology. So anyway, um, so typically when I do a refactoring, one of my primary goals is to make the code easier to read because reading code is harder than writing code, and so it's very important that we focus on, re on readability. Uh, today we're going to do the opposite. And the reason we're going to do the opposite is because I want to take a deep dive into ienumerables and ienumerators. <laughs> and um, I want to see what they actually, how they actually work beyond the C-sharp level. And so uh, we're going to end up with some pretty heinous code, but hopefully it will give you an idea of what's actually happening you know, under the covers. So uh, let's get started. All right, let's start by taking a look at basically our test apparatus for today. And so we have this method, demonstrate yields, and basically this only exists to demonstrate the yield statement, and we'll talk about how that actually works. Um, but this method will basically return a list, or more technically, an I enumerable of integer. And within that list, or that enumerable, it will return the numbers 0 through 9, but every other one will be that number times 2 sort of. So uh, it's a slightly incorrect way of saying that this will return 0, then 0 times 2, then 1, then 1 times 2, then 2, then 2 times 2, up through 9, and 9 times 2. Um, in fact, right here I have that exact sequence, 0, 0 times 2, 1, 1 times 2, etc., all the way through 9. This is our expected output. We're getting the enumerable here. And then down here I'm actually iterating through the enumerable and comparing it to what we're expecting. And I know there are more efficient ways to do this, but I specifically wanted to talk about for each, so I'm doing it this way. Now, I don't like to make a lot of assumptions about what people know about C-sharp, especially some of the lower level stuff that we don't really have to get into in our day-to-day -day jobs. And so um, many of you are probably aware, but if you're not, the code we write, the C-sharp, actually gets compiled down into an intermediate language. Uh, it's a bytecode language, and it's called strangely enough, intermediate language or common intermediate language. Uh, you will probably never have to deal with it if you're just doing web development, but it's still kind of interesting, I think, to take a look at it and see what it's doing. And the reason I mention this is because intermediate language is a much, arguably a much simpler language in that it has much, uh, has significantly fewer commands than C Sharp does. For example, uh, for each doesn't doesn't really exist at the IL level or the intermediate language level. In bytecode, there is no for each. Instead, it has to do some stuff like it has to get an enumerator and then it has to call move next and it gets the current value and stuff. And we'll talk about what that looks like in just a second. Um, but just know that for now, there is no for each. Uh, also, there is no yield. There's no, no concept of a yield at the IL language. We have to write IL that sort of emulates what a yield is doing at the C-sharp level. Probably the best way to understand ienumerable and ienumerator is to actually implement them and see what they look like. And so we're going to start with the enumerable. Uh, let's call it example enumerable. And we're going to implement ienumerable of type int. And I'm going to let Visual Studio tell me what that looks like. And so if you look here, there is this uh, get enumerable for the non-generic version of ienumerable. I don't really care about that because you'd have to cast this down in order to call this method. For example purposes, I'm just going to leave this as not, a, not implemented. But for, the, for this, we need to actually return an ienumerator. And I keep, <laughs> I keep emphasizing ienumerator because it can be kind of hard to differentiate between numerable and enumerator if I kind of mumble like this. And so I apologize if I sound kind of weird. The cold doesn't help. So let's implement an I enumerator. Example enumerator. And this has to be of type int as well. Let's see what Visual Studio says that interface looks like. Okay. 
So we have current as an integer. Now Visual Studio picked integer because that's the type we're using. If this was an I enumerator of type string, this would have been a string. So we have to implement this one. Uh, this one is the generic version. For this example, I'm not going to implement this. Not a big deal. Um, dispose, we don't have any items that need to be disposed, so I'm not going to implement that. Um, what's left is move next and reset. These are things that we will need to implement. Um, so now you know kind of what an iEnumerator looks like. How is this being used? Like you've probably never, well, I don't want to assume, but maybe never actually gotten an enumerator and then manually iterated through the enumerator. Let's take a look at what this is actually doing. So C Sharp is actually generating some code that is not for each. It's generating something else that looks a little differently. It's generating something that calls these methods. So um, just for an example, I'm going to comment this out, bring it back, and I'll show you roughly what the C Sharp is actually doing. So there is no for each. Instead, we need to get the enumerator out of list. So we call get enumerator, and that's going to tell us that enumerator is type I enumerator of int. And if you remember up here, we saw that this is disposable. So the compiler is going to just assume that maybe this needs to be disposed and generate a using statement around it, or you know, an approximation of a using statement in intermediate language. Then we're going to need to check, we're going to need to loop through this. And the way the compiler does that is it calls move next. Move next returns a true or false depending on whether or not there are more items to actually take a look at. And so it calls enumerator move next. If it's true, then we have a variable named item that comes from current. So now if I run this, it works. And I can tell it works because it didn't throw an exception. Now if I were to break this, then it throws an exception. Just to, just to prove that it's actually validating that the list matches what we're expecting. So I'm going to switch this back to 2. So just as an exercise, I thought maybe it would be interesting to implement sort of a very simple enumerator in here. And so the way we do that is we have to manage state. So let's do an enumerator that goes from 0 to 9. We won't do the, the double thing, just 0 to 9. Um, so we're going to need to have an idea of what the current number is. Now, I, it's tempting to just do current number, but I like to do a nullable int because there's sort of like this state before you've started enumerating where there is no state, right? Then most of our logic is going to end up being inside move next. Um, so the first time you call it, current number is going to be null. So, so if it does not have value... True, wow. We start at zero, and then we return true. So then the next state is that we are less than the none, you know, the end result. So we're gonna plus one and return true. Otherwise, we're at the end of the list and we need to stop iterating. So basically, we have three states. We haven't started enumerating. We're enumerating, but we're still sort of like, we still have more items to go through. And then we've finished the list. And then the last thing we need to do is actually return the value from here. Um, now I'm going to just kind of cheat a little bit and do dot value on the assumption that they've called move next. Um, this is kind of a thing I don't like about the way enumerators work in C Sharp is like I could get an enumerator and call current before I call move next and current would be like in an inv invalid state because I haven't iterated anything yet and so I feel like 
current shouldn't even be available to me until I've called move next. Um, I don't know if we'll do it in this episode, but in some episode we'll talk about a way to fix that. But, uh, finally, I guess the last thing we need to do is the reset, which basically sets all the state back to its original state, sort of the this pre, pre-enumerated state, which is basically just returning current number back to null. So that's like a very quick and dirty implementation of an enumerator. Okay. So what about the demonstrate yields method? Uh, it's returning I enumerable of type int, which implies it's returning a class of some kind. But within it, we're only doing yield return of integers. We're just returning integers. And so how does that work? There is no class here. Well, the compiler is generating the class for you. And so I thought it'd be interesting to sort of do the compiler's job and actually write that class for ourselves and give you an idea of what the compiler is actually doing. So to do that, we're going to need a demonstrate yields enumerable. It's going to implement the I enumerable type or interface, excuse me. And so once again, take a look at this. We know from before that basically we just need to return some kind of enumerator. Okay, so we need a class that implements that now. And then let's implement this. So now the question becomes, here we have a loop. We're counting from 0 to, well, basically 9, and returning these values. How do we mash that into this weird interface? Basically, we need to like do some work and then return true at the first number, and then we return true again at the second number, and we continue to do that until we're done. There's a bunch of ways to do that, but I'm going to take sort of the most naive approach and we're going to do it basically the way the uh, compiler would do it. So I'm going to move my loop here, my for each loop, down into move next. Now sort of like for each, for loops don't really have a construct in CIL, in intermediate language. Um, there are only, you know, incrementing numbers, checking conditions, and then jumping. And so a for loop is actually implemented as go-to's basically. And so let's do that. And the reason I'm going to do that will become clear later when we look at what we end up with. But for now, just go with me on this. We're going to get rid of this for and we're going to implement it as if we were writing intermediate language. So first, uh, we need to mark where the loop starts. So we'll just set a label called loop start. And some of you might even be looking at that and being like, label? Like, yeah, you can technically have labels in C Sharp, and you can call go to and give it a label and jump to that label. Uh, we don't see it very often because it's not a very good way to code, but we're doing it here because we want to know what the compiler is doing. So I would never recommend that you do this in general, uh, but we're going to do it here. This is kind of a weird quirk is that I have to have a semicolon here if I have a label that has no code following it. I don't know why, but... That's what we do. So uh, we have the loop start, we have the loop end. Now we have this time before the loop starts, which is where we initialize our value. So I'm going to pull that initialization out and put it there. We'll initialize our counter. We have this x++, plus plus. this is the increment thing. That happens right before the loop is over. And then we have our condition, x is less than 10. So up top, if if x is not less than 10, then we're done, and we need to bail out. So we're going to jump out of this loop, loop end. Then I'm going to get rid of these brackets, because there's not really a concept of brackets either. These yield returns will still need to change, um, but the last thing we need to do is at the end of this, after we do the increment, incrementing of our counter, we need to go back to the loop start. Yeah, semicolon. There we go. So now we've implemented our for each loop as if it were intermediate language. Basically, we set a label. If we are done with our loop, we skip everything and go to the end. 
otherwise we you know eventually we'll fix this but we return the one value we return the two values we increment our counter and then go back to the start of the loop so now we still have an issue um, we know that the way this is going to get iterated um, it's going to call move next repeatedly but right now we call move next we set our counter to zero we do some stuff then we call move next we count set the counter to zero and we do some stuff so the counter never actually changes the counter is actually needs to become a field level value Ugh. so we'll set that up here so now when I call this move next is is my counter less than 10 we we'll do the stuff otherwise we add one and go back so the counter will actually increment as you expect but we still have the problem that we return here um, but we can't do a yield return within this which just needs to be you know uh, we just need to return true or false and so what we can do then is instead of trying to do yield return we set the current value to our counter and we return true and then we're gonna do the same thing down here why does it not like this oh my current is currently read only because that's what the uh, enumerator interface expects it's just it just calls for a get so if I don't set a give it a set it's not gonna by default have one so I'll give it a private set so we can set current equals true and we're gonna do the same thing here now you can see that the uh, compiler is already complaining because this code is totally unreachable right so what we need to do is track where we're at in this so the first time I call it I wanted to check this X is 0 I want to set 0 and I want to return true then the next time someone calls move next I don't want to start at the stop again I want to start where I left off at current and then I want to double it and I'm gonna return true and then the next time someone calls it I want to pick up again where I left off add one to the uh, counter and go back to the start of the loop so on and so forth and so the way I do that is I track the state I'm in so basically everything up to the before the first yield statement all of this code that's state 0 I haven't done anything and then this code is state 1 and then everything following that is state 2 so now what I can do is um, I'm gonna label these right so ugh, Lord call this state one and I think I need to set my colon there I'm just gonna run up you know the loop start up to here then this is state ugh. try I'm trying so hard to put spaces in these state two and then after that one is state three so now what I can do up top here is now that I'm tracking state if state zero oops I said one I started at one I am not a VB programmer I swear indexes start at zero okay I'm sorry and again I'm writing this basically the way IL would write it And so finally, the last thing I'm missing here is after everything is done, I need to return false. Let's get rid of my yield statements here. <coughs> and actually, I'm missing one last thing. So when I come into this now, I see, okay, I'm at state zero. So we jump to state zero. We start the loop. Uh, we set the current value to zero, return true. Next time we come in, well, state is still going to be zero. And we're going to do the same thing and we're going to loop forever so i forgot before i exit my method i need to set the state for what it should be for the next state so i'm at state zero i need to move to state one next time i call this well let's just go through it again first time you call it we're going to be at state zero we go to state zero start the loop uh, we check uh, we set current to zero then we say state is equal to one return true so then they call it again now we go to state two state one excuse me now we set current to x times two return true 
again, I need to set the next state, so I set a state two. Now the next time they call it, we're at state two, we go to state two, we add one, go back to the loop, and set the current to the next value and return true. The one thing you might want to do is at the very end here, I set it to you know state three or something, and then you can just you know, this is sort of like a way to protect yourself, I guess. Once you've reached the end, you're done, you should just always return false. So there's really sort of three states, four states here. Um, let's see if this works. We gotta clean up a few things. Uh, I need to get rid of this dispose. I mean, I don't get rid of it, but I need to, you know, get rid of that throw exception. Um, reset, once again, we have internal state up here of X and state, so we just need to set those back to their starting values. Okay, and so now what I can do is instead of calling demonstrate yields, I'll new up a demonstrate yields enumerable and let's launch it and see what happens. Fingers crossed. Hey, it worked. So basically what we did is we wrote a state machine. Um, every time we enter the function, we're at some known state. We do some work, and then we set the state to what the next thing should be and then kind of return back. And then the next time you call, we know what state we're in, we do some work, and then we yield back. That's what the yield statement is doing. This is basically what the compiler generates. So before I said that we wanted to break that if statement down into basically what uh, the compiler would generate. And um, I kind of want to show you what would have happened if we hadn't done that and show you why I did that. So let's remove the loop start, loop end. Well, let's not remove it. Let's put this in here. So this now becomes four. Now we don't have to declare x because it's outside of the scope of this. Less, less than 10, x plus plus open bracket, and then we need to get rid of this loop end here. Thanks for reformatting everything. Um, let me get rid of that. Uh, so you'll notice that uh, compiler doesn't like this because now we've opened up a new scope in this uh, code block. And so go to state one just doesn't work anymore because state one is outside of scope of this go to statement. You can't jump into a new scope as far as C sharp is concerned. But with the way uh, the compiler generates this, the, the IL, this is all just basically a, a, a linear list of function of uh, commands. And so you can go to anywhere in that list, and so it's not a problem. So that's why I removed the for loop and replaced it with something like IL, but at the C-sharp level. So there it is. That is what the uh, C-sharp compiler generates when you use yield statements. Generates a very simple uh, enumerable class, which also, and then it also generates an enumerator class that has this kind of crazy state machine built in. Um, is this particularly useful knowledge to have? Probably not, but I think it's interesting. It's, I think it's maybe not uh, strictly necessary, but it's fun to know what the compiler is doing, you know, behind the scenes. And uh, who knows, maybe someday, You'll have to do some low-level stuff, and you'll look at this, and you'll recognize, oh, that's a state machine. I've seen this before, or um, I know how I can do that, doing this very, doing similar to what the compiler is doing, or something. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, I hope you at least found it interesting, if nothing else. So uh, that's going to do it for right now. Uh, maybe some other time we'll look at different ways to build state machines, uh, particularly lists as state machines. I think are really interesting, um, but. Yeah, thanks for watching.